I will just uh, officially open the event. Um, I just want to mention that this event is going to be recorded. So please be aware that we are recording it. And uh, the recording is going to be on uh, GCU TV channel, uh, I believe, from tomorrow on. Um, so I want to welcome you to this uh, uh, event, which is part of uh, our Digital Delights and Disturbances uh, lecture series. This is a lecture series that uh, we, the Communication and Media Studies Department, have uh, uh, started in uh, uh, spring 19. And uh, yeah, this is the first uh, pandemic edition. Um, so today we are very happy to be here uh, in yet another Zoom meeting to talk about something that uh, it's actually going to critique Zoom and the interfaces uh, uh, that we use on a daily basis. Um, yeah, I thought about, you know, asking if you can hear me and see me and you can give me a sign if you can see me <laughs> because uh, actually this is the way we start all our meetings uh, pretty much these days. Uh, we start our classes by saying, hey guys, are you there? Can you hear me? Uh, can you see me? Can you please give me a sign? You know, and we start our uh, lectures, uh, classes, uh, business meetings, uh, but also parties uh, that we are increasingly hosting on, on Zoom and other platforms as if we were having a seance, you know, which is, uh, you know, calling the spirits. And so today I'm gonna start this meeting by, by calling the spirits, invoking our spirits before uh, starting the journey uh, into the fear and loathing of uh, being online 24 hours uh, at a time of a pandemic. And fear and loathing of the online self was actually the title of a conference that we hosted, uh, uh, that we had together with uh, Gert Loving and uh, uh, Biela Coleman who are with us today. Um, the question is, who are these spirits uh, that we are calling, that we are invoking, by the way? Who are the souls uh, of the platforms that we use on a daily basis? Uh, we spend so much time on them that there should be a soul, shouldn't, shouldn't be a soul in, that, in those platforms. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we did a, a workshop uh, uh, a workshop in hacker pedagogy. Uh, it was called the demons game and the goal was to learn how to deal with the demons of each of these platforms, uh, Zoom, Meet, uh, um, Teams, uh, that we use on a daily basis. So to try to understand what they do to us uh, while we are very innocently, naively, thinking that actually we are doing something by using them. We are just using them, uh, which recalls, you know, uh, rings a bell uh, into my head. I, I remember um, Marshall McLuhan used to say, media works, uh, works us over completely. They leave no part of us untouched, unaffected and unaltered. And this is something he wrote uh, in, in his seminal book called The Medium is the Massage. And I guess, I mean, these days, I mean, he was pretty right. Um, I, I want to show you, uh, speaking about the demons, uh, I want to show you the uh, poem. Let me share my screen, like briefly, just to show you this. Um, so this is the, um, the MS Teams voice. This is the, the poem that we composed during the, the workshop in Hacker Pedagogy, which we run a couple of weeks ago here at John Cabot. And the poem is composed by keywords that the students have uh, given to us during a brainstorming session and also taglines that they have created, uh, you know. And then uh, we have put all these words together, all these taglines together in order to create uh, this poem. Come to my layer and find a comfortable spot. Be there and be squared. Let me square you. Let's crash together. I'm informal, but you can inform me. People are circles, uh, words are linear. You know, this is pretty, you know, awesome. I really loved uh, to do this workshop in Hager Pedagogy. And, uh, you know, what really struck me uh, reading this poem was that many of our students' uh, uh, expressions, you know, words that are used in this poem uh, recall geometry. You know, they use words such as uh, squares, circles, uh, and, and now, as I speak to you, I see myself in a small rectangle, 
you know. Uh, in, in my essay, Teaching into the Void, I call this the tyranny of the rectangle, you know, the way in which I see myself, uh, um, uh, this uh, Brady Bunch style, and I see my friends, my colleagues, my students, uh, all, be, all of them being confined into these geometric forms. So I wonder, is this the new tyranny of geometry, the new abyss of quantification to which the pandemic uh, has thrown us in? Uh, neuroscientists say that what, what makes us feel so tired after very little time spent on these devices uh, is the fact that we have to constantly gaze at ourselves, uh, uh, something that uh, they would call the hypergaze. Because, you know, during in person meetings, uh, people aren't staring at your face from a close distance, uh, people are distracted by so many other things because they enjoy an holistic view of the person. But video goals disrupt this natural rhythm and they force everyone to stare at each other. And first of all, to stare at ourselves. And I just want to read a quote from uh, the head of Stanford's Virtual Human Interaction Lab, uh, who recently was quoted in a New York, New York Times article about Zoom fatigue. Uh, he said that from an evolutionary standpoint, if somebody was very close to you and staring right at you, this meant you were going to mate or to get into a fight. You know, so either something very nice and positive or something really bad. Uh, but the, the problem is that today we stare at ourselves uh, and uh, at other people um, just because that's the only thing. Uh, that that uh, we can do. And uh, during in-person meetings, of course, people do not feel the need to exaggerate non-verbal behavior. Um, and they are, of course, not forced to stare at themselves. But this is what we are obliged to do when we use uh, video sharing platforms. And, and so also in my, essay, I, in my essay, I talk about the awkwardness of my own experience as being a teacher who is obliged to have the camera on and while I teach uh, I have to stare at myself which is unbearable because usually when I teach on site I don't have my face in front of me, I don't see my wrinkles, I don't see my expression and the fact that uh, I am obliged to stare at myself creates uh, a lot of problems, you know. Uh, and so basically uh, uh, we are entering now an era that is characterized by this uh, hyper visibility of the self, uh, which is at the same time uh, something that marks uh, the crisis of the gaze. You know, what does it mean to gaze at our self? Uh, and who are we looking at and what for? Uh, this would be my initial uh, take on the issue that we are discussing today. And um, I wanna introduce the, the speaker, the discussants, because you know this is gonna be a, a debate and, and please feel free to uh, interrupt us, uh, wave your hands or, or write uh, in the chat uh, if you have questions um, that you wanna raise. So I will introduce the speakers in strictly alphabetical order. So I have uh, first uh, Gabriella Coleman. Hey Gabriella. Uh, we know each other from uh, fear and loathing uh, of the online self a couple of years ago. Uh, so Gabriella holds the Wolf Chair in uh, Scientific and uh, Technological Literacy at uh, McGill University. So she's talking from Canada. And I mean, she is the anthropologist who authored the seminal work about uh, the hacker collective uh, Anonymous. I bet many, actually we study our, our uh, essays in our digital media culture classes. So our students are very familiar with your work, uh, Gabriella. And she's of course also a pioneering scholar in applying uh, um, uh, eth uh, ethnographic methods to the study of the digital. Uh, then we have Gert Loving. Hi Gert. Uh, who is uh, a net critic, founder of the Institute of Network Culture in Amsterdam. Uh, is also uh, someone who has worked extensively with us. Uh, we have done a number of uh, initiatives together, namely Fear and Loading of the Online Self, which was co-organized by, by us, Roma Dre and uh, by Gert. Um, then he's the co-founder of uh, amazing networks uh, such as the Money Lab and the Video Vertex uh, Network. And the last but not least, the author of uh, many 
different and very important books on uh, uh, internet critique. Uh, I will just mention uh, Social Media Abyss and uh, Sad by Design, which we also read, uh, get to read excerpts of, the, of, it, of them in our classes. And then um, last but not least, we have Shannon Matter, uh, connecting from New York, and, and Shannon is a professor of anthropology at the New School in New York. Uh, a writing uh, focuses on archives, uh, libraries, and other media spaces, and um, she uh, she is also uh, um, leading a very, for me, in super inspiring module together with uh, uh, Mary Elizabeth Luca and uh, Annette Markham on digital methods in ethnography, which is really amazing. I would love to be a, a part of it, you know, one, one of your students, uh, like in uh, hearing how you teach digital methods and in, in such an amazing uh, in, uh, cross border setting. And uh, Shannon, I mean, she has also, uh, also written extensively. I just want to quote Deep, Maki, uh, Deep Mapping the Media City and Code and Clay Data and Dirt 5000 Years of Urban Media among her publications. Um, yeah, and last but not least, of course, we have Camilla Lessi, our own Camilla Lessi. Uh, Camilla is uh, going to be the spokesperson for the student government today, uh, John Cabot uh, University student government. So she's going to convey questions, remarks, uh, observations from the student government to our panelists. I owe, I owe a personal thank to student government because they've been amazing, uh, super helpful. Also, when I, I did my essay, Teaching into the Void, uh, uh, they have been super helpful and, uh, and willing to, to be interviewed, uh, to talk to me about their experiencing in uh, uh, being in this hybrid learning setting. Okay, so now I will shut up because this was very long. And uh, yeah, I would like to give the floor to whoever among our panelists wants, unless we want to keep uh, strictly the alphabetical order. And then maybe uh, I should give the floor let, let's, for the first round, let's keep the alphabetical order. So and I will give the floor to Gabriella. Great. Um, I'm on the unlucky end of the stick. But thank you and thanks for that introduction. Um, it, was, it was great. And thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, when Donatella reached out to see if I'd be interested in participating, I kind of um, balked a little bit because I'm not doing any deep research on this topic. And so I was quite concerned um, and I felt like an imposter and, uh, and she kind of convinced me and, and, and she convinced me in part through her essay, which I really think is an incredible piece of writing, uh, both in terms of reflecting what we've all collectively gone through. Um, and it's also a really important piece of auto ethnography as well. And I think really captures the finest of the genre. And I wanted to be here for um, various reasons as well, one of which is I'm actually done with Zoom teaching. And I felt like this would be a good commemoration um, and, way, and, 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 a, and a way to reflect back on the year as well. I sort of hope it will be the kind of end of long-term Zoom teaching, but that's a very open question, right, as to what will happen in, in the fall. Um, but I am precisely interested in um, both the question of the ways in which uh, the interface mediates and modulates certain possibilities, and then also how experience over time, whether it's because you become more used to the medium, you are able to kind of take hold of it, um, that experience changes. So to start, because um, I want to say a couple things about the start of the process for me. Um, but before I do that, I actually want to show a quick video from 1974 uh, by the artist Nancy Holt. And so let me just play the 40 second clip and then I'll talk a little bit about it and share why I think it's an appropriate video for this discussion. So let me share the screen. Put this here. It, it uh, uh, puts, puts a distance, a distance between, between the world and their, their apprehension, apprehension or, their or their comprehension. 
the words, the words coming, coming back, back seem, seem slow. slow. They don't, they don't seem, seem to, to have the have same, same forcefulness, forcefulness as, as when, when I, speak I speak them. them. I, think I think it's, it's also, also slowing, slowing me down. Me down. I, think I think that it that makes, makes my thinking, thinking slower. slower. Were you all able to see and hear that? Okay, great. So the video is um, from 1974. It's part of an art project that was called Boomerang. And Robert Sarah, who collaborated with her, recorded Nancy Holt as she um, talks. And then here's her words played back after a bit of uh, electronic delay. I believe it was one second. And this was uh, played on um, public TV. Um, you could find the whole 10 minute clip on YouTube. And I actually used this clip at the beginning of my lecture class, um, which was entirely on Zoom uh, for various reasons. Uh, but I think it, it represented how, as a professor who's been lecturing for quite a long time and really comfortable with the medium, felt like I was thrown all of a sudden to like, um, I, was, I was basically thrown on the floor and basically all expertise I had was gone, you know? And it was so disconcerting um, to feel like I was unable to lecture uh, effectively or well. And the feeling, I, 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 I would describe the feeling as zoom, doom and gloom, you know? And I felt completely like an imposter. And I felt like I had to psychologically walk through mud in order to even, you know, do my work. And then the lecture itself was one of the most painful <laughs> experiences of my life um, for various reasons. And I, could, I can talk about why, you know? Um, and, you know, honestly, for the lecture, I mean, things improved a bit. Uh, but in, in some respects, it never felt like it got all that much better. Um, I felt like the seminar classes were, were very different. That was actually much easier. There were aspects to the Zoom seminar that I really quite enjoyed. There was aspects to the medium itself that brought different things to the table that is not possible in the classroom. Right, so it's sort of like two different genres intersecting with, you know, one um, technological medium is, is a kind of good reminder that the interface and the medium, you know, shape certain possibilities, but then there are some differences based on the kind of genre that gets threaded through the interface in, in certain regards. So um, I, I just wanted to kind of open with that provocation which is a bit of a kind of throwback to the beginning. Um, I think I have some other thoughts around change over time and where we're at, uh, but I'm gonna leave it at, there, at, at that for my opening thoughts for now. And, and Antonio, yes, uh, the echo was very, very much part of, of the original as well, of the original piece. Thank you, Biela, and that's an amazing video. Wow, from so many years ago that it's really crazy. Um, yeah, with the eco part as well. Um, yeah, let me give the floor to Gert following the alphabetical order. Gert. Are you there? Can you hear us? I'm gonna repeat, you know, the. It's like a mantra uh, now. Yes, <laughs> okay. The spirit has come, thank God. Yes. Please. <laughs> uh, welcome everyone. Um, yeah, um, we were doing a, a project together at Donatella in the spring with um, John Cabot students uh, a year ago. Um, selfies in quarantine. And uh, in part based on that, uh, I started to collect uh, materials for what then uh, 
you know, became my essay um, on Zoom fatigue, uh, which you can find um, on uh, Eurozine.com. Um, and there I have used some kind of um, what I call the chorus technique to write, you know, and what we're doing here as well, to collect as many experiences as, uh, as possible, um, to uh, reflect and to, um, yeah, to really uh, critique also and uh, to find a new language, what Gabriella also just mentioned, right? You, you're kind of in a stupor you, you, when, you're, when you're in this new situation, which feels very uncomfortable um, for teachers and students uh, alike. Um, so we had to find a new language. Um, and I think we have made some progress there in the last uh, year. And this is clearly uh, Donatella also reflected in your piece that uh, came out um, early January. We're now um, in, in April and uh, I agree with um, Gabriella. You know, I really hope that within a few months we can forget about all this. However, <clears throat> I fear that this is not going to be the case because uh, there are many, many reasons why, you know, from an economic uh, perspective, um, especially uh, education bureaucrats love this uh, setup. It's very cheap. Uh, it scales up very easily. So I fear that, uh, you know, we're not going to uh, get rid of uh, this um, environment anytime soon. Unless, of course, uh, you know, we, um, we organize and um, really try to not only understand what our situation is, find the proper terms for it, but also develop uh, strategies to um, resist it and to overcome it. Um, and I think that's gonna be really the next uh, phase. However, uh, we also know uh, that there is this so-called uh, transitional period. And um, with my new team here at the uh, Institute of Network Cultures in the last couple of months, we've done extensive research on, you know, what is now called the hybrid condition. And I want to describe that uh, briefly because that's where probably we're heading in the next, you know, couple of months. Um, and I hope that we will not get stuck in the hybrid. Uh, situation. The hybrid situation being, the, you know, that there are people in a room, but that there are others, maybe half or, you know, maybe even uh, 10 times the amount that are um, online uh, from elsewhere participating in the so-called real, um, real life on-site uh, event. Right, and this has really been uh, prepared already, especially uh, you know for a lot of the cultural events. And uh, I've participated. You probably all ha have already participated in one way or another in a um, hybrid event. Now I'm not sure, Donatella, maybe help me out. Is this already a hybrid event? Are we in Rome? In fact, are we at John Cabot? Yes or no? No, well, no, actually, no, no. no. I no. mean, but, uh, uh, maybe just Sadzelia is at John Yeah, exactly. Uh, so she's, but, uh, the, yeah. she's the she... absolutely avant-garde in that respect. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. So um, this is really something, uh, you know, that we need to, um, we need to discuss because, um, First of all, it's probably quite important from the student perspective to probably, you know, start to organize anywhere, you know, from the summer or the fall onwards, um, you know, the, the Zoom or Teams refusal days or, the, you know, like really strike, Zoom strike. Um, and uh, I haven't really heard 
um, that they uh, exist. But don't be surprised, uh, even in the coming weeks or months, uh, you know, that uh, this will uh, uh, will come. And uh, we all, of course, traditionally look at Italy, you know, to organize the first uh, massive Zoom uh, or team strike uh, and demand, uh, you know, to go back to, uh, to, to the classes and to the real uh, life. Mm -hmm. Uh, in education, but remember, this goes well beyond the field of education, right? We, here we are, and in your essay, you are talking about teaching into the void, but remember uh, both specialty teams is used uh, in all offices, even factories, uh, you name it, right? Uh, in, in a lot of the social uh, situations uh, at the moment, right? So the, so the, the issue goes well beyond uh, the already massive uh, educational context. Okay, now, so there is the phase in which we have to resist uh, um, going to the so-called hybrid events that a lot of the bureaucrats and uh, managers will use to implement that people will stay at home, that um, you know that we will be forced. And now COVID is forcing us to stay at home, but in the next phase, the new economics uh, or austerity measures or, what, or whatever circumstances will force us to stay at home, right? Okay, so that's one thing. The other thing, of course, would be, and this is also what we often do uh, in INC and in our networks, to ask, you know, what are the alternatives? And I really want to discuss them also here, uh, because we always balance the radical critique with the desire and the design of alternatives, right? And, and there, I think, you know, it's also a, a design and a software question, which uh, teams and Zooms uh, completely leave uh, unanswered, right? And I want, I want to give some um, indications there, maybe, you know? And the first, I would say, uh, you know, is uh, kind of, um, let's say, the human right. Uh, Donatella, you indicated that, you know, to switch off your screen. I'm not even sure, can you, one of you maybe look how many how many of the participants have uh, we are here with 78 people how many have uh, switched off the screen anyway uh, i embrace this i welcome you all uh, and um, i understand that for the teachers you know this is a really really difficult situation however we should be on the side of students and we should design this hmm? instead of complaining uh, about it. Because uh, Donatella, you've listed a lot of reasons why people do this. You were probably one of the first to do that instead of just seeing it as a, you know, as a, as a problem or, uh, yeah. So we should take that uh, uh, really on board. Also, I think uh, because it has a lot of very, very interesting aspects to it. It means, for instance, that we can scale up much, much larger, right? And I'm very, very interested. I don't know how many of you have participated, you know, in conferences with 1,500 or 2,000, 3,000 people. And that's very, very interesting, right? Because the Zoom aspect of this, this kind of controlling of your image, et cetera, completely uh, becomes irrelevant, right? Once you scale up, this is no longer the issue, really. It's an issue for maybe the person at that moment that talks or presents, right? <clears throat> it is much more like a, the, a Colosseum uh, uh, situation, right? You are there with four or 5,000 people looking at the Roman spectacle, right? And there's nothing wrong with the Colosseum, with the theater, you know, in, as such. Hmm? Um, so 
So, uh, and a lot of people actually also from Africa, from Latin America, from Asia, they are participating nowadays in events, right? They could never afford, they could never attend. And so there's a good aspect of that, let's say, uh, spectacle. Um, uh, but the software itself is not really, really participating in it because Zoom is ambivalent uh, about this, right? Okay, and then of course, there's the radical other thing. And that is of course, uh, when you work together with a small team and you're trying to get things done, you're trying to communicate, uh, you're trying to coordinate, discuss, debate, disagree, uh, you're working on something uh, really in a team, right? And there you could go, we could go back to the original idea of teamwork you know, which in revolutionary situations is, is a good thing, right? Because we're planning something, we're going for something, right? We have a, a common task and we try to fulfill that task. And online, we have a lot of tools. And there again, Zoom and, uh, and Teams are completely and utterly failing, you know, as really co collaborative work environments. And there have been so many, um, you know, work environments that are so much more advanced than this, right? And where are these tools, right? We've already seen that with Google and Facebook, you know, completely failing when it comes to the really uh, to provide us with the tools that actually exist, that the tools that they themselves have developed, right? <laughs> that should be, uh, you know, at our display, but that, but that are not. And we know why that is, because they think we are overwhelmed, we cannot deal with it, right? But think of, for instance, very simple tools like voting, et cetera, right? You are, we're now with 77 people and, you know, maybe they should vote now that I should shut up and that we move on. I think that would be a very good thing. Hmm? But where are these tools? They don't exist, right? So the whole idea of a common kind of, you know, discursive production completely fails here. Okay, I'll leave it here. And um, I'm very curious, uh, you know, what your responses are. Let's discuss. Thank you, Gert, for pointing out uh, this aspect by design. Uh, it's like uh, your obsession, you know, after sad by design to understand how collectivity or collective work or revolutions could eventually be designed uh, through software as well. But I think you raise a very important point. Uh, one of the things also we discovered when we were doing the Hacker Pedagogy workshop with the students was that actually, you know, even the names like Teams, uh, that's how Microsoft uh, uh, does imagine uh, a corporate team working, mm -hmm. you know, but not a classroom, not a bunch of uh, uh, people working together for social good, you know. It's how a corporation works. So the name uh, is very, gives you the illusion that you are working in teams, but actually there's just the name and that's it. The features, as you said, uh, are not there. You know, and we are left just with the, the geometry, as I was saying, like the circles, uh, the squares. Uh, that's the managerial aspect that uh, Teams uh, has left us with, but there's nothing more. So I think you touch upon a very important issue, which is like uh, designing software that is uh, collectivity friendly, which we don't have in this moment. Um, but uh, now I leave the floor to Shannon. Okay, thank you. So um, Donatella, you started off with a phrase like everyone everyone begins kind of their addresses. The new call to attention is the can you hear me? Can you see me? There's also a hip hop song from 1996. It's DJ Cool's Let Me Clear My Throat. And I feel like the whole like let me share my screen. Every time I say that, say that, I think of it in terms of that, that song from 1996. That's another one of the kind of probably most frequently uttered phrases of the past year is that let my let me share my screen. I also had the same reservations that Biella had when she when you had invited me to take part in this isn't really an area of my research, but it is definitely something I've thought about in, in regard to how I have transformed my pedagogy over the past year and in relation to a lot of the work I've done over the past several years about interfaces and designs and how they scale up to physical spaces, etc. Um, and I, I guess I was lucky in that I taught several classes over the past um, 
intercession in January and three semesters that really lent themselves to becoming object lessons through this transfer, this move to online pedagogy. Last spring, as the pandemic kind of came to fruition, I was teaching a class called Data, Data Artifacts, Infrastructures, and Landscapes. And moving from an on-site class for half the semester, moving online, we really got a chance to rethink the core concepts of our class, how all of a sudden we were kind of living amidst infrastructures. Our landscape of education had transformed. Um, and then in the fall, I was teaching a class on anthropology and design. After the summer of um, Movement for Black Lives uprisings, we had a few teach-in days where we were asked to transform our lesson plans to address issues of racial justice. So we really got to talk about a lot of these kind of oppressive systems, the way that a lot of our educational software, including Zoom, Canvas, other frequently used systems, are and can potentially be kind of parts of a carceral state, systems of surveillance and oppression with data then handed over to law enforcement. So we were again able to use the, the corporate and um, kind of surveillance culture uh, uh, infused ideology of a lot of these platforms as object lessons in relation to the larger political issues that were still present to this day, but especially kind of pertinent um, in the early fall after all the summer uprisings. This semester, I'm teaching a class called Mapping the Field, it's an anthropology class where we look at cartography as kind of a field method and look at histories of colonialism and mapping. So we are able to think about place and space and our distributed networked condition made possible through a lot of these and limited by a lot of these technologies. So we kind of tried acknowledging the limitations of these platforms, but still kind of use them to add a new dimension. This hybrid model that Hert was talking about gave us a new way to think through the core, the core concepts to our classes. Um, in regard to your question about uh, the daemons of these software, Donatella, I think also the limitations, the hiccups we've run up against um, uh, and, um, also gave us interesting things to think with. So when we were praying to the gods to allow us to kind of overcome the, the potential thwarting influences of the daemons, we're both we have to consider potential limitations or, or glitches in software, in our cameras. My external camera has kept going out this semester and then I have to stop class and open up my laptop. Graphics processors are another thing we have to pray to. Internet connections, transition of cables, satellites, national firewalls. Some of our students can't get certain software in their home and their nations because of, you know, uh, federally imposed um, uh, restrictions. So these are all the different demons that we're dealing with in uh, assuming that we have this global connectivity. So um, it's kind of interesting to think about all of those um, uh, potential up, um, uh, disruptions anywhere along the system. Uh, also, on the positive side, I've thought again about how, yes, it has been limiting in certain cases, but there are other modes of participation that it has made possible. And it's certain students who might have been very reluctant to speak because they're now dialing in from the comfort of their own home, feel a lot more comfortable participating, and they have more modes to do it, especially in small groups. They're in their comfortable terrain. They feel a lot more comfortable contributing to a small breakout group than they would have if we were on site in a neutral domain. And if they don't feel comfortable talking, the chat has been a really active site of discussion, a really vibrant back channel that then certain more vocal students will find really salient points from the chat and bring them into the main, to the kind of the live um, kind of auditory discussion. So that's been a really nice kind of intertwining or enmeshing of multiple dialogues happening simultaneously. I've also been really interested in the formal possibilities. And early in the pandemic, I started to make an arena channel, like asking on Twitter, wanting to know how artists were thinking about the new formal possibilities. Because in the past, I've written about how artists have used kind of um, bureaucratic software, word processors, slide decks, et cetera, as their medium of creative development. So I was wondering how people were using Zoom and, and, and Slack and other things as creative media. So how it's created really interesting new limitations, which generated possibility in theater, performance art, the whole genre of performance lecture, the desktop lecture has really kind of exploded over the past year. Visual art, musical performance, lots of new interesting opportunities there, telematic art, some of which offer aesthetic which are also epistemological possibilities that we can bring into the classroom and other more um, maybe traditional public events. Um, to get Hertz's point about the desire to use open open source tools, this is something that I've talked a lot about because I, I work with a lot of libraries. And they too have seen the fact that no longer are they just serving their local population in the branch and uh, the neighborhood branch. They'll be having an event about, I don't know, uh, ESL or citizenship or some, and they'll all of a sudden have a global audience. The whole diasporic community from around the world is dialing into this little branch library's online activity. 
And um, uh, as a member of the board of the Metropolitan New York Library Council, I meet with all the directors of the libraries. And they've thought often about this is maybe a, a reminder, a call to action that we really need, need to have a public alternative to these corporate platforms. And libraries, again, if they're well-funded as they should be, that could be a great kind of hub for thinking about what a public interest technology, public access infrastructure could be like. And there's a lot of, especially as over the past year, a lot um, um, in light of the, um, the new light shined on digital divide issues that are persistent, new calls for public interest technology and public access infrastructure. Um, and then finally, this whole issue of the fact that this might be over for the most part in the fall, I'm not sure that we want it to be entirely. There are a lot of lasting lessons we should draw from this, both in terms of accessibility, in terms of considering what aspects of a, of a class, of a public program, of public pedagogy, do well online and which are supplemented. What are the affordances of each of those different modalities? And also I just wanna call out um, Ami Hamrier's work who writes a lot about the history of accessibility, who's doing a project now about um, the whole history of remote access. So what seems to us like a purgatory that we can't wait to get out of has been a very pleasant and necessary reality for people in the disability community for years. This is not something that they necessarily need to get out of. It's not um, uh, a holding pattern. This has been the reality. They made a very vibrant communal space. So maybe there are lessons to be learned from that community. And for us to hold on to certain things we have adapted this year in order to make our own work, our own teaching more universally accessible. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you so much, Shannon, uh, also for pointing out that there are indeed uh, positive sides of this situation. And uh, as you said, uh, limitations uh, can oftentimes generate creativity. So maybe we should look at the possibilities that are generated by the use of these interfaces and also the ways in which we could eventually work with the glitches of these platforms uh, to make something, you know, aesthetically compelling, politically interesting and uh, worth for the collectivity as well. Um, yeah, I'm tempted to ask a lot of questions, but uh, I think this is the time uh, to give the floor to Camilla Lessi because we have invited our student government body to this meeting. And uh, uh, I know that Camilla has uh, collected questions from the student body. And she's eager to ask you guys um, these questions. So Camila, are you there? Again, my ritual. Are you there? Can you hear us? <laughs> my camera's on. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Please, Camila, I leave the floor to you. Okay. Uh, so hi, everyone. Um, I was talking with the student government and we came up with mainly four comments slash questions, but a lot of you already kind of talked about it, but maybe you could go further into an explanation. So the first one that we came up with was, as students, uh, we have noticed that we're progressively becoming less eager to attend classes, even in person. So for instance, after the latest Italian lockdown, fewer students came back to in-person classes, even though they were still in Rome. Uh, so do you think the Zoom fatigue is limited to just online classes or also to the back and forth between online and hybrid? So I'm going to jump in here. Um, first of all, those comments were, were all great. I have tons of responses to them, but I, I want to get to that question by acknowledging the pandemic, which is interesting because in some ways it's, it's one thing that has not been stated yet, right? And I mean, I completely agree that these technologies have a lot to offer in terms of new modalities for participation, access for workers who don't necessarily have to be in the office all the time. And, you know, to hear its point too, like, unless we take control of it, right, we're not going to necessarily get the best of those, right, um, aspects will get some of the, the worst aspects. But I think one of the reasons why you have um, such a kind of lack of desire to participate in classes, um, you know, does in part have to do with the, the hybrid situation. But I also think it also has to do with the fact that, you know, we're, we're like locked in as well, you know, in a, in a very profound way. And that also makes us experience everything differently, right? So, 
you know, it's not simply that Zoom as an interface, you know, um, as a tool and as an interface is problematic even with the kind of positive aspects. It's the fact that you're like in your apartment day in, day out without having time be cut in different ways, right? And then that kind of experience seeps into um, the one mode that we tend to have consistently, right? And so when, and when I was kind of beckoning for a hope to end this, it's, it's a hope that the pandemic will be kind of over because that's in some ways the storm clouds, I think, hanging over everything, right? And the uncertainty around that. And I know, you know, it's interesting here too, um, hearing your comments, because, you know, if anything in North America and, and Shannon, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but the push is to go back in person, you know? And that is because people want the kind of face-to-face -face experience. And, um, you know, we all know why we all miss that, but there's some level of anxiety, both for students, staff and faculty over like, oh my God, am I gonna get sick and, and die? You know, like that's still always hanging there, you know, at some level. And so I just feel like part of the conversation we're having over media and medium also just has to be refracted through this, you know, question of the pandemic, which is maybe so obvious at some level. And yet at, at some point, hopefully that will be gone. But I think, you know, both Shannon here are completely correct that will still have the medium, you know, and it has some really amazing possibilities to offer for work, for political organizi organizing, for teaching. And the question is like, who takes a hold of it? But Camila, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think that in, in, in regard to your question, it's a mix of how difficult it is to live and to work under conditions of extreme uncertainty, anxiety, um, and for many, you know, like a literal sort of lockdown in, um, you know, being forced to be in, in one environment for, you know, days, weeks, and months. Mm -hmm. I just jump in and say, like, the one thing that keeps me engaged is, like, how much my students care for each other. Like the distribute again, digitally distributed, geographically distributed, digitally networked condition has created really nice study groups, support groups amongst them. The feedback they offer to each other in our Zoom classes has just been amazing. Like it's been almost tear inducing some days how uh, it's not as if I didn't notice these things on site. It's just maybe the poignancy of the year has called attention to them in a new way. But I feel that um, not the classes, the classes are what keep me going, but everything else, I think it's just as Biela said, like the exhaustion of the year. Another thing that Zoom has made possible is that it has essentially made me obliged to be available to students in Europe, on Asian time zones, I'm having office hours at eight in the morning at 10 p.m., teaching all afternoon. My meetings have exploded. I have about probably 30 hours on Zoom every week. Whereas in the olden days, there were maybe one or two days a week that I wouldn't go on campus and I could do things like class prep, grading, reading a thesis. Now I'm on campus every single day and sometimes weekends too. So I think that students have said that too. Their number of obligations of scheduled programmed activities have exploded. So I think that has just really worn down people too. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone else have a comment that they want to add? Um, can I comment on something? Yeah, I've been a student for John Cabot. Um, so, well, first of all, thank you everyone for this great uh, speech, I will say. And I'm really glad I'm here. Thank you, De La Rata, from De La Rata for bringing me here. Um, I would say that as students, as a psychology student also, we've been, my dog is playing with a toy, sorry. We've been uh, like really, really stressed and we've been having uh, um, these many stressful weeks and all of our professors are trying to make these things better. I mean, at John Cabot, at least, all of our professors are always like so like, super available and they always ask us like do you guys need any more time like you you guys know we're in a pandemic so if you need any more time something happened just let us know so what i'm i'm appreciating the most is them being able to 
also kind of change their habits. You know, like we have professors that are strict, we have professors that are less strict, but the strict, strictest ones are trying to change the way they are. So I'm also very glad about this because I see that you guys are humans too. And sometimes we forget that about you professors. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I completely agree with Letizia and thank you all for the comments because it's everyone has, we all changed our habits for Zoom and for this online learning that we're all forced to, let's say, face. Um, but yeah, everyone has to change their schedules, their habits, and at least it has allowed us to learn to be more appreciative of our professors and all the people that make time for us, even though the, when they're not supposed to. <laughs> Um, okay, if there are no more comments, I can go on to the next question. Yes, okay. So the next question is, um, when we are on social media, we usually portray a pic picture perfect image of ourselves. And in a way, that's how we feel with online learning. When we turn the camera on, it's because we feel good about ourselves. Otherwise, we usually say, my connection's not working or my camera is not working. So what do you think about this performative aspect of online learning? Anyone can answer. <laughs> yeah, oh, for sure. I'll, I'll give it a try. <laughs> Uh, because, uh, you know, for years we've been uh, studying uh, uh, yeah, all the aspects of uh, the selfie. And I think that's where, where it started, kind of. Um, you know, because that self-performative aspect uh, is already in there and uh, it has a long history. Um, you know, um, so for some it even goes back... Um, to the self-portrait or, you know, to uh, art history. There's many, uh, you know, good things have been written uh, about that. Uh, I would like to point to the book uh, by Anna Perajka that uh, we in the Institute of Natural Cultures published that, uh, you know, really even looks at uh, the precise angles. Um, so uh, so there's, there's that, uh, aspect and yeah is there something wrong about it Dude, the a lot of the the first generation let's say zoom critique uh, studies and and um, comments looked at uh, at this uh, aspect of uh, the perspective of uh, but especially also the the ongoing attention one has to give to the self right and this is an element that already came up in in the in the selfie studies, right? Because the selfie is never just one picture, right? If only that would be wonderful. You just make one selfie, <laughs> and then uh, use that for the rest <laughs> of the year, or uh, you know, every five years you'll have a new selfie. Uh, yeah, that would be wonderful. But we know the reality is very different, right? Uh, the selfie is, is in fact an ongoing uh, production of, of pictures, um, uh, several hundred uh, a day that uh, people uh, make, or it's very common, you know, to have, what, five, ten a day or something, you tell me, you know, uh, there's a, <clears throat> so it, it is about this kind of a constant production of the self-image, right, a reproduction of it. Uh, and this is what um, you know makes it uh, so so exhausting, uh, if you like. You're all kind of on camera um, in a live broadcast, you know, almost twenty four seven. And uh, honestly, uh, you know, who can uh, really um, perform uh, well, uh, you know, in such a time? That that's impossible, right? So the. So this is kind of the, the fatigue element 1.0, which we, we probably should not forget um, because, um, okay, a lot of aspects came later after that, but this is uh, kind of where it all starts. 
Yeah, thank you so much. I'll say also that there's been an acceptance of like a degree of imperfection too, because um, people, um, you your people's dogs are making noise in the background and you have to leave because the, I don't know, the washing machine is overflowing and the baby's crying. So you're reminded that people are have multiple subjectivities simultaneously. And also, as I was mentioning earlier about the lengthening of the workday, like I'll have meetings in the morning, class at night. And when I have office hours in the afternoon, sometimes I'll say like, I'm just going to go outside and walk and talk to you. I cannot stand sitting at a desk or looking at a video anymore. So it's like accepting the fact that like the phone, we forgot that the phone works, you know, that's a non-visual medium. The auditory connection can be really intimate and beautiful. You don't have to stare at each other all the time. So that's a way to kind of eliminate one degree, at least of that perform uh, performance obligation. Um, maybe an another comment. So, um, and I like that. I like the, the fact that it's true, you know, um, there's these uh, situations where there's stuff that happens and, and you can't um, forecast it, right? And it happens as you're on screen and it's a very kind of humanizing moment, um, you know, that tends not to happen in something like a seminar room or a lecture hall. Um, uh, you know, one of the things I did think a bit about in the fall when I was doing a lecture class, which I explained how much I hated. <laughs> uh, and I, I hated it in part because I was being recorded, you know, and it was just so painful for me to, to watch myself afterwards and watch my imperfections, right? And yet on the other hand, what I thought was potentially so great about it was if, you know, we had a little production help. I mean, if you think about some, something like podcasts or something, you know, there's producers, there's write, writers that they're were really well done because it's not just one person, right? Um, and I thought, wow, you know, for my lecture class, it would be really much, um, there'd be a lot more possibilities if I could record a good 20 minute module, right? That everyone watches before class. And then during the lecture, just have an interactive session, which I love doing in my lectures anyways, right? But I have to cover a bunch of stuff. Um, but I would only want to do that kind of um, 20 minute lecture if it was, you know, better produced. And that requires kind of some support and time and resources, right? But there really are some very exciting possibilities that this moment has opened up, right? Um, if we're willing to kind of think about them and, and possibly institute them. Um, I definitely, you know, know that recording is really important for accessibility, right? Uh, there's no question about it. But still, there is something about being recorded that I've never loved, you know? And it, you know, we know in the surveillance literature that you feel self-censored. So it's not only about hating your imperfections, but I do feel like I'm far more conservative in what I say when I'm being recorded as well in the classroom. And so I think that just points to the fact that, you know, with most uh, possibilities and configurations, you have some benefits and some, some downsides and you could kind of modulate um, both of them in different ways. But for me, the, the, the recording is always tough for that reason. I just wanna ask uh, something to the students, like building on what uh, Biela just said, you know, because I, I felt the same way, like Biela, like I really hate the recording thing. And I do think that kind of, uh, drives you to be more cautious, conservative, and uh, yeah, because it's like self-censorship and self-surveillance. But I wanna ask, because my impression is to also students, especially, you know, when we are in a situation like, yeah, in American uh, kind of learning environment, liberal arts, where uh, the lecture is always very interactive and based on, on comments. Uh, so my feeling is also that students themselves don't like to be recorded. Am I right or wrong? Uh, guys do you feel that You're recording right, yeah because i yeah. feel that recording right. also blocks students from expressing you know it's not necessarily like for expressing uh, no non-conservative views but i think the mere fact that they can can be rewatched 
you know? And so their thought can be evaluated by not only the professor, but other peers, uh, uh, scares them out. This is my impression. Yeah, absolutely, Prof. Also for what concerns, again, psychology classes, you know, we always open up each other and we always say something to the professor because he's a psychologist, a psychotherapist. Uh, whenever we talk about something so personal, we don't like to be recorded. You know, we're talking about our own traumas. And also for what was, uh, you know, Gabriella and Shannon were talking about, um, about camera on and camera off. You talked about it in your essay uh, extensively. For what concern privacy? Uh, you know, I may be with my parents, my grandma, my dogs, like you, like everyone is inside our own apartment. And that's not always so nice. Like you don't know who you have like in front of you or who is watching you. So we talk about it in class, but I, in your classes, Professor Dalat, I never keep my camera on. Um, and I like listen to you very well and actually better. Sometimes I feel more focused when I don't have my camera on and when I'm not looking at myself because I get too like too focused on myself and I swear I'm not narcissistic but I do. <laughs> yeah thank you Letizia. What about you Camilla? Do you, do you feel like uh, the surveillance part of like uh, when we record lectures? Yeah I completely agree. I think we fear <laughs> we have this big fear of not sounding smart and when we're recorded we're afraid of maybe like making a comment that sounds stupid or something so we're just afraid to maybe say what we think even though it might not be the smartest thing it's always something that can that can be elaborated on but we kind of keep ourselves from making that comment just because we're afraid oh my gosh we're going to be recorded and someone's going to see it and I just don't want to not look smart. <laughs> so I think it's like this yeah. fear that we so have. I, I think we do share this issue, professors and students, that we do not like uh, recording. And also I want to add that uh, uh, as a person, as an individual, not uh, as a professor, but as an individual and as a citizen, I do not like the CCTV camera on me. You know, I do not like to be, even if I have to record myself, I would rather have, as I, write, I have written in my essay, the ring light. Please give me the influencer's ring light so I can look glamorous. And so students can look at me and think, oh, she looks like 20 years younger, you know. But please do not give me the CCTV camera who's overlooking at me because students are fluent in the aesthetics of global surveillance. Uh, they do know that if a shot is taken from high, from a surveillance camera, this means uh, censorship, surveillance, surveillance being watched. Uh, and it's not uh, healthy to associate this kind of aesthetics to a learning environment. Uh, so I would rather go big time for the ring light, for the influencer, for the YouTuber. You know, these in the end are, are the personalities of our millennium, but please do not give me Foucault. You know, I don't want to go back to the Foucauldian, uh, you know, uh, nightmare of last century. Let's, let's move on and uh, let's buy ring lights instead of CCTV cameras. Sorry for that. <laughs> but really the recording thing, plus the aesthetics of recording is really something that I think should not be associated to teaching and learning. I think you've left us all speechless. We, I agree 100%. More I ring know. lights, also yeah. less expensive, you know, than <laughs> the <true>. cameras. <laughs> does anyway. anyone, yeah. Does anyone have another comment on this question? I was okay. thinking also how there are these different ethical systems that are wrapped up in this issue, though, because we're often encouraged to record specifically for students who might be in other time zones or might have family things going on related to the pandemic. So it allows them to keep up with the class. So so you have different kind of ethical concerns that you have to weigh here in terms of whether to record or not record. That's right which makes it even more complicated because there are always exceptions to the rule. So it's not definitely not a black or white situation. Yeah, and that students always are like, oh my gosh, the professor doesn't record the class, but 
we know like that there is something behind it. We just don't want to meet it, you know? So yeah, we complain all the time. I'm sorry. <laughs> For example, I do when it's needed because a student cannot uh, follow uh, synchronously. I record only my lecture. This is my policy. I never record class discussion because I do a seminar discussion once a week and I do not want my students to be on camera. I want them to feel free about expressing their opinions, if saying something controversial, you know, and not being judged for what they say. So I'd rather put myself in the awkward situation of having to record myself, but not the students. Yeah, what I hear from teachers uh, here in my school, which is a very big polytech with 50,000 uh, students, is there is there is this distinguishment we need to make between, let's say, pre-recorded um, classes uh, um, and um, and then the the other part, which then can be more interactive. And I think that's where we're probably heading. Uh, when we leave the, the kind of the first um, corona related Zoom and uh, teaching, uh, you know, um, and Teams um, phase. And then I would say, we, we haven't really talked about it, but um, we will then enter some kind of a MOOCs to that zero period. I don't know how many people have, uh, you know, produced. Uh, uh, education material for MOOCs. Uh, of course, uh, the hype with MOOCs uh, and uh, with online uh, education, you know, was already over in uh, maybe in 16 or 17, but, uh, you know, they're all still there. And uh, this is probably where, where it's all heading, you know, better produced content for higher, for bigger classes uh, worldwide. Uh, which leads probably to more efficiency, uh, cut, uh, cost cutting, and maybe then to a new role for all of us, including the students, to be more engaged in the um, interactive part. And what do we make of that? <laughs> Another topology for thinking about that rather than the kind of the centralized MOOC is um, um, Donatella mentioned that I kind of interloping on get Biela's domain, who's like the, one of the global experts in digital ethnography. It's just that because to serve our students in my university who were realizing that their field work suddenly couldn't happen. Mm -hmm. They wanted to learn about a methodology that had been trivialized in some cases, marginalized, not part of their repertoire. So I worked with um, Annette Markham and she has this model, nothing about a MOOC, but a mesh network of crowdsourced short videos that can be shared across the world, put out to the public domain for people to really work with, to share whatever their expertise is to benefit students and faculty around the world. It would still be based on like local hands-on instruction, but really benefiting from shared expertise of people from around the world. And you know, it's so interesting because I feel like even before the pandemic, I was moving to that model, you know, in my syllabi and, and some of you might already do this, like a short reading, a podcast, a talk, right? Like you know, I think Shannon, you've you've talked and worked a lot with um, kind of theories of curation, you know, and obviously as professors and teachers, we do a lot more than curation, but that is an important component. And um, again, that's something I did before, but I especially did it, you know, during the pandemic. And that's something that I don't think will stop and shouldn't stop. There's just such amazing material online, right? Um, I think teaching right now, um, and by now, I don't mean necessarily like under the pandemic, just with uh, availability of this, these resources is really amazing and exciting, right? And we could just be a bit more thoughtful about it as we move forward again, because the pandemic is this kind of like big moment of like, oh my God, we have to stop and reflect on things, right? So I agree. I mean, here, I think you're right too. Like, this is something we have to worry about, right? in terms of um, a kind of model that, you know, at some level is not a bad idea, but at another level, if it's used to sort of like squeeze out um, more professors, right? So that you just have the online content and then a very small cadre of, you know, elite professors that do the interactive stuff. Um, 
that's a possibility, right? And so we have to be on guard and try to kind of stop these things if they if they start to bubble up because it's it's very very realistic it could happen. Right. Thank you so much. It's, I think it's very important, as you all mentioned, to look at both the positive, but also the negative aspects of online learning. But something we've noticed, like as students, it's what everyone has been saying, it's just so hard to look at this bright side, and this positive light that can be found in online learning, because we feel as if we're robbed in some way of our college experience, especially like I'm graduating this semester. And I haven't, we're probably, we're having a commencement, but we don't even know if that can happen. So it's just so hard to look at this bright side when there's so much, not damage, but like hurt and negative emotions that are associated with this online learning. And I wonder like, how's it gonna affect us in the future when we're gonna probably be forced to work online too and we've now associated this negative emotion of feeling like robbed of our university college life. So how's it gonna affect us in a year, five years, 10 years? Can I say something? I'm a JC alumni, I graduated last year, and I can tell you, Camila, that I know what you're feeling because that's what I experienced last March when we were all put back in the house and uh, the streaming started on, Zoom calls and uh, Zoom lessons, sorry. And uh, in that moment, we all felt like that, the sensation of being robbed from the opportunity to be with friends, professors. I mean, most specifically, like maybe saying bye to our professors because our professors were like, you know, part of our journey from the beginning to the end, you know, and uh, they saw us grow up, this, you know, and I think for them it's a pleasure to see us graduate finally. And, um, and I think uh, that sensation of feeling so uh, far away because of the computer, you know, uh, but at the same time, I would like to say that, you know, uh, after one year, and, and I'm still waiting for my commencement, as you uh, will be, uh, hopefully get it, uh, I can tell you that, uh, that sensation of being robbed will go away because of one feeling, that the feeling that all what you've learned, all what you've mastered, and all what you've felt that three years chase you, even if some semesters you're at home more than in class, you will feel the experience more in you than ever before. Uh, you will still feel that sensation of accomplishment. You will feel it. It's weird, I can tell you, but... Um, you know, um, I've met a lot of students who graduated from La Sapienza or our university abroad, and they can tell me, look, it's the same feeling, but you have to look at the positive, which is you made it. First of all, you're graduating, you still are. You're, it's not like that's gonna be taken away from you. And the second thing is like, do call your professors after you graduate. That's what I did. I called most of my professors saying, look, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna see you for a coffee or, or, or a pizza for saying thank you, but you know, I would, I would like to acknowledge you. So that's what I can tell you. And last thing is just, you know, um, it will affect us in the future that we, if ever it happens again, which we hope not, um, we know how to instruct our future generations to, you know, how to approach this in a mental and uh, academic way, hopefully. That's my take on it. <laughs> but Josh, I love this positive, uh, you know, impact that you are giving us because it's so important what you said. It's amazing. I mean, I think professors are like our parents pretty much because yes, like, we are. see them more than our parents probably and I know we're all like super sad about not having commencement this year again and I am also very very sad about this uh, but like I don't know if we'll have commencement for like the next two years three like who knows like no one knows about anything in the future and uh, I honestly am like so sorry for this pandemic just because of like my social life because it's pretty much zero now and I only need to see my friends through FaceTime and this is so sad but most of it like I'm super sad about you know not seeing my grandparents they are old already I don't know how much they have left I'm sorry to be so negative but um you know like that's what I'm like most care about we are such like 
lucky people. We got to study. We are at John Cabot, an amazing, an amazing university. And I always like remind myself that we are very lucky compared to many others, other people. And we are super lucky to have like such great professors. But yes, we were robbed <laughs> from the world, pretty much from getting to experience the world. I had to go study abroad. I didn't. Well, life happens stuff happen um, but let's try to keep a positive mindset because I really hope that our next you know bosses they're gonna know that we did this and we graduated in a pandemic and we are the best so just think that <laughs> preach Letizia preach <laughs> keep saying that <laughs> I think they have said it all, Camilla. I think yeah, the students yeah, were the, the best one to answer, you know, our silence is not because, because I think our silence also signals that, uh, of course, you have been robbed. I mean, as a matter of fact, this has happened. And uh, I mean, bad things happen in life. And unfortunately, this was like something huge and, and global. But uh, I have to echo what uh, the alumni, uh, alumnos uh, said, uh, I don't remember your name, sorry, Rajiv? Uh, Rajesh. Yeah, Rajesh, sorry. Uh, because also I experienced, and uh, you were there last year when one of my students uh, graduated, and this was just after the lockdown, you know, in Italy, we had the three months of very strict lock lockdown from March to May. And then we had uh, to host our classes completely online. And I remember one of our students, uh, one of my students uh, um, got uh, graduated in May and he said, you know, I would, I would like to have a drink with uh, you professors and the people in the class that I was teaching at the time, post-colonial cinema. And I remember very clearly that when we met to, to you know, to drink and to cheer up, it was such an amazing experience for me, I think, the atmosphere was super emotional and I think I have never looked at my students uh, the way in which I looked at them, you Camilla and the others in the class right after the lockdown, because that was the first time that you really realize uh, that you should treasure what you have, uh, which is for us, the students and vice versa. So I felt for the first time, like being loved <laughs> completely by my students. And I also felt uh, in complete harmony because it was, you know, really the first time when something is taken away from you, then you would appreciate it even more when it, it is given back to you. So I, this is my wish for you and for the other people who are graduating um, that you, yes, you have been, uh, this year has been taken away from you, but hopefully uh, in the next years, you will be given back. That gave me so much joy. <laughs> Thank you. Me too. I'm hopeful now. <laughs> yeah. So those were my questions from the student body and our feelings about this terrifying year, but hopefully as Professor De La Rata also just mentioned, we can learn how to cherish these little important glimpses of light that we can still find in our everyday life. Well, thank you so much, Camila, for conveying uh, uh, the issues and concerns and questions uh, on behalf of the student government. That was amazing. You guys have been amazing, but since there are also other students and actually uh, about 70 participants, in this uh, Zoom meeting. So I would like to also open the floor to the other people who didn't get a chance to, to talk or express their concerns or, or just comment on the experience. And I know that there is a very mixed audience. So not just our students, but also other professors and other people who are joining this meeting. Um, so please uh, raise your hand or just speak, you know. Uh, or write in the chat uh, your question if you prefer to write it, because we would love to hear from you. I would rather hear more comments and questions from the audience rather than, you know, asking myself. Uh, Donatella, can I say something? Oh, this yeah, is sure. Franco this is our president. Yeah, sure, please. Um, 
first of all, congratulations. I think this is an excellent uh, uh, program, webinar and discussion. And uh, I've been hearing a lot of very interesting and very stimulating considerations about uh, what we are going through. So really congratulations for putting this together. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, to, to, to try to put a bit in perspective what we are going through. First of all, you know, I think a lot, and maybe older people who are in this seminar, in this seminar nobody's old as I am probably, but uh, older people, uh, they very often, I ask myself, how would I feel if I had been robbed of my time when I was 20, 21, thinking of all the great things I was doing at that time, of how much fun I was having in university, uh, the excitement, uh, you know, being free or going wherever you wanted. Uh, how would I feel if I had been robbed of one or two years of my life? And uh, I think that uh, this must be uh, making us really impressed with the resilience of our young people today, or how they're able to function, to, to, to study, to work hard, knowing that uh, a lot of their life has been compressed by this crazy event. But, you know, I want to put in perspective this uh, by looking uh, I, I just given a conference in January in which I compared uh, today's pandemic to the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu occurred the year, exactly 100 years ago. And uh, the, the latest uh, uh, analysis that has been done about that event says that at that time there were 1,500,000,000 people. Of that 1.5 billion people, about 800 million people got infected. More than half of the population. And uh, about 80 to 100 million people died. And it lasted, you know, it, it, it happened in a way like this one, because it arrived in, the, in, 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 in spring, then it disappeared in summer and people thought it was over. And then it returned in fall and it was really lethal. That was the time when it was really murderous. And then it disappeared, just vanished. Maybe it was herd immunity. A lot of people have been you know, uh, infected or whatnot. Uh, but uh, one thing that I would like to say is that after the end of the Spanish flu, the Roaring Twenties arrived. It was a time of incredible energy, of incredible life. And very quickly, in a way, people forgot about the Spanish flu. It wasn't really in our collective memory until this pandemic came. So uh, I think let's keep it may be a positive perspective about the time when this madness will be over, when vaccine will arrive, when the virus will weaken, herd immunity will arrive. Because I have a feeling that very quickly we'll revert to a lot of the things that we were doing before. And I think that uh, we can look to a much more livable and a much more rewarding time. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Pavoncello, uh, for this. Um, and uh, yeah, I didn't know you were here. Uh, glad that you have enjoyed. Um, and uh, Shannon is uh, logging off uh, because she has another commitment. So I don't know if she's still here, but I want to thank her for being with us. Thank you, Shannon, for being with us today. and. Uh, uh, sharing your thoughts and insights with us. Um, Thank you for having me. 
Oh, you're still there. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I look forward. I, I'm going to follow your uh, ethnology, your digital ethnology, uh, trans uh, across the border, you know, uh, seminar, because it looks really. Uh, I just say that's mostly Annette and Emmy Luca. I was just grateful to be able to participate with them. That's really there. They're the, really the, the, the prominent forces behind that. But yes, it's a great effort. Well, thanks again, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the conversation. Thank you so much, Shannon. Yeah. Bye. 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 Um, okay, I just want to maybe ask a, a, a last question myself, and then if I see uh, questions popping up from the chat, I'm going to reopen it. Otherwise, we should probably wrap up because we don't want to contribute to the Zoom fatigue. But as uh, an ending... Professor, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Ray has uh, her hand up, so she probably oh. wants to say something. Yeah, please. Before. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to give like my two cents, especially on Professor, what you were saying about um, the the fact that it was more like a wake up call that you know we we would interact via Zoom. Like right now with the pandemic, we're interacting on Zoom. However, even like before the pandemic, we still were so attached to like either our phones or we would have we would see kids on on the table with their tablets while eating which is also what we're doing now. We might be like in meetings, in between meetings where we have to rush and kind of eat. And I feel like it's a wake up call to, to kind of say that, listen, like we, we've kind of been, uh, I guess in a way, exaggerating the, the amounts of time that we've been using uh, these technologies. Uh, and now with the pandemic, it kind of just exaggerated it a bit more with the fact that we're limited and and the freedom of choosing is taken away. And I hope, hopefully now when this whole pandemic kind of is over, we could start realizing, you know, that we should actually connect in real life because I feel we, we were losing touch uh, in comparison to like our past generation before technology was everywhere. And I think it's kind of uh, a good realization to kind of reflect back to it and hopefully once it's over maybe not go back onto how it was because it wasn't right the way it was before but going back in a perspective where we actually become social by interacting in real life and not just on social media and just communicating via uh you know cell phones or emails or all of this so i just wanted to point that out real quick and want to draw opinions on it Thank you so much, Ray. Yeah, I, I think what you were talking about, it's uh, definitely, you know, a concerning issue and probably a lot of people, at least, I mean, I, I, I see this in my classes, a lot of people are manifesting the same kind of feeling that you're expressing now that uh, probably we have gone too far with the use of social media even before and, and now we are realizing also the importance of balancing. Uh, with on-site, uh, whatever you want to call it, because in real life, I do think that social media is real life, uh, you know, so I don't like the expression in real life because social media has become real life. So I want to say maybe online slash or, or offline or on-site. But anyways, um, thank you for mentioning this. Um, I just want to very quickly, because I see also Gert has left, uh, and that's a pity because I wanted to, so we have one speaker left and no, I he's, really- He's still here. He's still oh, he's still here. here. Yeah, okay, so, still, Gert, so maybe you can get him. Yeah, because I really want to talk uh, at least for five minutes before you go, um, together with Biela, uh, reflect and the others, uh, reflect on what you mentioned before, this hybrid condition. Mm -hmm. So you said, I think it, this is very important to try to reflect also, Biela mentioned that uh, there are lessons learned from our side um, during this year of uh, online and not just teaching, but doing everything like socializing, uh, working, etc. So what are the lessons learned and how we can understand now this hybrid condition. Uh, this is really interesting to think about uh, how is this hybrid condition uh, going to be configured in the future? You said, I do believe you're right that this hybrid condition is gonna stay. So even when the pandemic is over, we will not get back to normal as we used to know it, but there will be new forms of normality, you know? So how does it look like? Uh, how does this hybrid condition look like and how we can 
uh, you know, also kind of contribute to designing it, to imagining it, because I think uh, it's important for us, you know, to think about that and not just to sit down and wait for what's going to happen next. Uh, and uh, also, I like something you mentioned before when you said uh, we were talking about scaling up, uh, you know, so because we are now so obsessed about our own gaze, but because we are still in small groups. But how about, you said, a Colosseum view? So how about thinking about this new medium in a situation in which uh, it will bring us together, you know, and mm -hmm. Shannon also mentioned that uh, so many things uh, couldn't happen before are now happening because of this media. So when the pandemic is over and the medium is left with us, what are we going to do and how is this hybrid condition going to look like in your Thoughts. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, this is a job opportunity for all the students, <laughs> really. I mean, uh, you know, to design uh, these new hybrid conditions is really uh, going to be a, a unique uh, task. Also because um, the current models are very crude and uh, are based on very old, uh, you know, pre-assumptions. The technology, uh, you know, we can do much, much more. And also, you know, we can subvert uh, so many uh, of the, the kind of uh, boring and, uh, and uh, corporate uh, pre-assumptions that, uh, that are out there. I mentioned uh, the collaboration aspect. And I mentioned, you know, uh, let's say, uh, you know, the really ambitious ones. You know, let's, let's go for planetary uh, democracy. Let's bring together you know, very urgently, uh, let's bring together people from, uh, let's say, America, Taiwan and China to prevent uh, World War Three. You know, if we are really thinking about urgencies, um, you know, this is really uh, or also uh, Donatella, what you've done in, you know, in the Middle East. Think about, um, you know, how these, these things can really uh, in a completely different way. Uh, you know, democratize uh, situations where all this is definitely not on the agenda of the new, you know, authoritarian uh, regimes that uh, really thrive on, on closed off uh, national firewalls. Uh, think of uh, developments, you know, in Turkey or uh, elsewhere, you know, where a lot of the regimes, the, the last thing they want, they want is open exchanges, self-organization, is people thinking for themselves uh, and also very, very unexpected, uh, you know, global uh, exchanges that, uh, you know, think of uh, something like global voices that you were involved in, but then, you know, 10, 20 years later, when, uh, you know, think of uh, what's coming to us. I always think about, you know, in five years, probably one, two, three billion people will have 5G connections with 8G, 8K cameras in their pockets, okay? Just add the two things and then uh, add the desire for more education, for exchanges, for uh, organization, organization especially, right? So that's one aspect. But we could, we should also go very, very much in the detail, you know, in really, really small groups where, where we kind of, uh, you know, get rid of this stupid gaze thing and, and uh, work together hmm? much, much more intelligent with the tools that we already have, but we haven't really uh, combined uh, the tools, you know, never, we haven't, we haven't done this. And so that's really uh, up for grabs, I would say. Except for, you know, the obvious things, the, the kind of European offline romanticism, like, okay, we have to come together again. And yes, yeah, that's all beautiful. We will do that, right? But that, that, that I'm really, really positive about. We will come together, you know, th that this is not the issue. Yeah, because that strong desire is there. And we will do it probably even, you know, within weeks or months. Even if authorities do not allow it, we will do it nonetheless. Huh? 
I hope you have managed to convince our students that they have a bright future ahead of them and they can work in defining this hybrid condition. <laughs> yeah, because, because like, the hybrid condition should come from, you know, below. Because yeah. the hybrid condition that comes top down is, is an utter disaster. You can imagine, and I've already said that, you know, the whole office real estate situation, the fact that people are, will be condemned to work from their kitchen or, uh, you know, um, bedrooms, um, you know, uh, let's not go there, right? We need to resist that. Right, but we need to find a creative solution and hack uh, into the system. And I wanna call Gabriella on this because uh, hacking is really her mm -hmm. words. Uh, you know, to this extent, I remember I saw a couple of days ago, you know, you know the issue, we didn't have time to talk about uh, Proctorio and the proctoring mm -hmm. uh, software, which is really a nightmare for students, but also personally uh, a concern also for many professors. Mm -hmm. But what I find really interesting is, is that students have already found a way to hack into this proctoral universe and cheat, mm -hmm. you know? So I want to also ask uh, Gabriela how to think about hacking, you know, in a creative way that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. hacking into this corporate environment that uh, tries to constrain us, to quantify us, to determine us. Yeah, Oof. big one. Um, I mean, um, with here it's where it's really, really, really important to yeah, push against the drive to force workers to, you know, work at home and with tools where they're being constantly surveilled. I mean, we're kind of here a little bit, whether it's like freelancers or UPS workers, right? Mm -hmm. And there are hacks to kind of evade that, right? But you are then only kind of allowing those with the ability to hack to evade those systems, right? And they will probably come with big repercussions. Um, so in some ways, like the most important thing is to kind of push against the intrusion of those systems of work surveillance, um, which are already well underway. And I mean, I'm mentioning this because I find that many of my own students go on to be um, leaders in different types of academic, corporate and nonprofit institutions. And like, you have the choice. You know, this is a very different story I'm telling than here, which I, I love and I endorse, right? But you also, um, if you have kind of power over what, um, you know, software gets used where you're working and all these things, you just have to make that choice. And it does actually make a difference, you know? So that is incredibly kind of important, I think, to, to think about. You know, another element, and this isn't so much about um, hacking, although this is a, a popular phrase in the world of hacking. Um, it's a phrase that I think connects to what would be needed to realize here its very ambitious vision which is less is more. You know, one of the things also that people have talked a lot about is while the kind of constraints of being locked up in one place and being confined and shackled to this um, medium is very confining, there has been something really wonderful about slowing down, right? And it's at many different levels, assigning less work, doing less things. I know that you know, a lot more people, if they're able to kind of um, get into a sort of rhythm, are reading more, you know. And I think we do have to do less for our own sanity, but also to realize the big politics um, and enact the forms of change that are going to be necessary to solve problems, right? And how to kind of cultivate that um, desire, sensibility, and ensure that happens is something that we're all responsible for. Um, and again, as professors too, you know, like assign less. It's not a rat race, right? You could really nurture deep, deep learning without over assigning. And I feel like it's been very hard to transition to that. And finally this semester, I, I was able to do it, you know? Last semester I tried um, since it was, 
you know, the first time I was really doing this pandemic teaching and I failed because of habits, you know, and then this time around it, it kind of worked, right? So how to, how to cultivate that ethic of less is more in every domain of life, both for the sake of kind of just preserving the self, but then also freeing the time that is necessary to enact, you know, small and not so small forms of politics, I think is really necessary. And again, we've, we've all been able to experience a little bit of that um, ethic under pandemic conditions. Yeah, I, did, I think this. <laughs> Someone has, that's Gert. <laughs> Are they throwing you out of the office? <laughs> I think this is a good ending note. Uh, together with what Biela just said about less is more, I think we should free Gert, otherwise, he will stay in the building for the night, you know? So I want to thank Hashtag you. Hashtag uh, free Gert. Free Gert. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Gabriela Goleman, Gert Loving, Shannon Mattern. Uh, thank you, student government, all the students uh, from John Cabot who have participated in this and everybody who has attended this meeting. Um, and this was part of the Digital Delights and Disturbances lecture series. I just want to give you a heads up that we are closing uh, the lecture series next week with a, a discussion on digital contagions, an amazing book by UC Parika. So we're gonna have uh, another interesting discussion, hopefully as compelling as this one, also next week. So please join us uh, April 22 at 6 p.m. Rome time and uh, have a good evening, uh, hopefully Zoom free. Thank you so much for being with us. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Bye.